Well, it's my pleasure to welcome you to another of our services, a service from uh, Larbert Baptist in central Scotland. I'm absolutely delighted that uh, you're able to join us, and I trust the Lord will bless you as you worship with us today. Psalm 84 begins with these words. The psalmist says, How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Friends, wouldn't it be wonderful if that was the case worldwide? That hearts all over the globe would cry out for the living God. Let's make that our prayer as we worship together today. And let's continue our time together in prayer. So let's all pray together. Lord God Almighty and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, at last we see our church buildings beginning to open. We thank you that after many months of prayer, we find that your people are able to gather in your courts, in your tabernacles, in your churches, throughout the land and beyond. And we do pray with the psalmist that this would warm our hearts, that we would look forward to returning to worship just as soon as we possibly can. We thank you for those who are able to join us live in person once again this weekend. But we are also mindful that many are still shielding, many still unwell, many anxious and not able yet to come to your churches. So for all who are listening or worshipping online, we thank you for the means that allows us to do this. We thank you for the technology which we now have. And we simply pray that whether we're at home, whether we're worshipping on our own or with family, or whether we're together in your house with our church family, we pray that our hearts would indeed be lifted, that we would magnify your name, that our worship would be pleasing to you, and that we would indeed be able to worship in accordance with your word in Scripture and in truth. So, we thank you for every opportunity to gather and to focus on our wonderful Saviour. And we simply ask that we would be blessed as we do that, not only for a few minutes here today, but be blessed in our lives as we look to Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. It's in his name we pray. Amen. And continuing with the theme of praise, our singers and musicians are now going to bring our first hymn, a hymn which speaks a truth, that praise is indeed rising. Thank you.
I'd now like to read uh, most of Revelation chapter 19. I had hoped to cover all of this chapter in our study today, but there's just too much here. So um, I'd like to read chapter 19, verses 4 to 16. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of a mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant, and your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, uh, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. We'll end our reading there at Revelation 19 and verse 16. Well, in this chapter, in Revelation chapter 19, we have a wonderful occasion. Here we have the marriage of the Lamb, or the marriage supper of the Lamb, as it's sometimes referred to. We've reached the end of the age, friends. Christ is back. He is back in glory. He has triumphed. And the world as we know it is gone. Uh, the message from the angel went out in the previous chapter. Uh, Babylon, that great Babylon, is fallen, is fallen. So the world as we know it has changed. Uh, the proud world, the anti-God world, and all the worldly systems that we've been used to for so long, these are all gone now and gone for good. It seemed as if they were with us forever. Uh, the world and its systems uh, we've known, of course, throughout history. And we have get, we've got used to the fact that things are always going to be the way they have been. But no, friends, the world and its system has collapsed. It's finished. It has disintegrated. It has imploded, collapsed in upon itself, and it's never, ever going to return. Now, of course, this uh, shock uh, has been delivered to the whole world. People are devastated. They didn't see this coming. 
Uh, they didn't see the Lord being triumphant. They had put the Lord uh, out of their minds largely. And now, of course, he's returned. Uh, he has shown that he is King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords. And all the things that they put their hope and their trust in uh, have all let them down. Uh, they looked to the world. They invested in the world. They put their hopes, their trust, their energies, uh, everything they were doing, it was all placed in the world. Uh, they embraced the world's values the world's fashions, the world's trends. And of course, that has all gone. What they thought was precious turned out to be worthless. And the things of God that they thought were worthless have turned out to be the most precious things of all. And people outside of Christ, they're in fear. They're in misery. Uh, they're in desolation because they've been let down They've been deceived by none other than the beast, the dragon, Satan, and his powers of evil. So their world system, um, the anti-Christian system, it has been overthrown. Uh, Christ has returned triumphantly. It's Christ who is victorious. And what does that mean for God's people? Well, it's quite simple, friends. They are called to rejoice. We're told that back in uh, verse 20 of uh, chapter 18, uh, the word goes out, rejoice over her, rejoice over the fall of Babylon, rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy prophets and apostles. So we're called to rejoice, we're called to worship, and we see the response to that call here in chapter 19. A wonderful uh, response. Uh, and what happens, what we see in chapter 19, is what can only be described as unrestrained, joyful praise and worship, just breaking out. So we didn't read the first few verses of chapter 19 in our reading, um, but it tells us who is involved in this worship. Uh, just look at chapter one, uh, sorry, verse one, for example. Uh, after these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, hallelujah, and salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. So here's the whole multitude of heaven joining in, uh, in praise of the Lord. Now, again, friends, I can't quantify this. Um, we're told in Scripture that there are an innumerable company of angels. Now, what that must be like when they all rejoice or praise together, I can only begin to imagine, but it must be wonderful. The multitudes, innumerable multitudes of angels in heaven are rejoicing. And that's not all. Um, there are others joining in this praise as well. Uh, verse 4, for example, the 24 elders are involved in this as well. Uh, now again, friends, we've been here before and we've discussed who these 24 elders represent. Uh, it's not just 24 people. Um, these are representatives of the church through the ages. Uh, we landed on the interpretation that at 12 and 12, the, the 12 patriarchs representing all the people of God in the Old Testament, the 12 apostles uh, representing all the people in the New Testament. Now put that together, friends, and what do you get? You get all God's people throughout all of history. And they're rejoicing in heaven. Um, they've all gone to be with the Lord. Uh, they've been waiting in heaven for their uh, resurrection bodies. They're there as spirits, uh, as disembodied spirits. And everyone who has ever put their trust uh, in God is in heaven. Uh, an innumerable amount as well, countless millions down through the ages. And they too are rejoicing in praise. Uh, represented by these 24 elders. Again, try to imagine, friends, all the godly people who have ever died throughout history, the innumerable company of angels, and they're all bursting forward in praise for the Lord. 
And there's more as well. Um, still in uh, verse 4, these four living creatures, uh, these mysterious um, wonderful, magnificent, mighty creatures uh, that inhabit um, the space around the throne of God. Uh, the cherubim, uh, they are rejoicing in praise as well. Now again, we have, a lot of us, in our mind's eye, uh, the image of a cherub uh, being something that we would uh, see depicted in paintings or in art down through the ages. Uh, and we perhaps imagine a cherub as a chubby little infant, um, perhaps with a couple of wings and a little horn or whatever. But we think the cherubs are like that, um, cute little creatures. Friends, I doubt that. I believe the, the cherubim and the seraphim are uh, strange but wonderful and mighty and magnificent creatures. And they too are joining in this praise. Um, and, and, and the great heavenly host that is praising God, it, it literally thunders out. Look at verse uh, 6. Of chapter 19 I heard as it were the voice of this great multitude the sound of many waters we've had that before in scripture referring to Christ but also as the sound of mighty thunderings and what's thundering out from heaven friends uh, hallelujahs for the Lord God omnipotent reigns here is Christ here is God triumphant and all of heaven, the entire multitude, is rejoicing and praising God. Friends, I, I can only begin to picture in my mind what uh, that must have been like. What John must have been privileged to witness. Um, it, it must have blown him away. Absolutely wonderful rejoicing and praise. Because Christ, triumphant, is indeed worthy of all our praise. Don't forget what's happened. Babylon is gone. It's gone for good. It has been defeated, never to return. And Christ is worthy of all our praise. And then some more. You know, friends, please, let's not rob God of his praise. Um, he deserves all our praise and more. So let's never miss an opportunity to come together and to worship and to praise his holy name. Uh, let's enjoy our worship, friends. And if, if, if worship isn't your cup of tea, if you're having difficulty enjoying worship, well then, friends, try to get to enjoy worship. <laughs> you'll, 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 you'll be going to glory. You'll be with the Lord. There'll be an awful lot of worshiping throughout eternity. Uh, you've got to get used to it here and now. So let's enjoy our worship. And friends, let's look upon it as a, uh, as a wonderful uh, act that we can do together. And it should thrill our souls. We should be thrilled to worship God. Because think of what he's done for us. Uh, think of how he's conquered um, all the powers of evil. Think of the inheritance we have. Friends, if, if that doesn't thrill our souls, well, I don't know what will. Um, so let's not rob God of his worship. Let's not sit at home and do something else when we have the opportunity to come together and to worship and to praise the wonderful God that we have. We can join with the multitudes in heaven, even now, in worship and in praise. Now, if that wasn't enough um, to rejoice over, uh, the triumph of Christ the defeat of the world's systems, uh, Babylon being gone. If that's not enough, well, there's something else in this chapter as well, friends, as I've already said. Uh, here we have the marriage of the Lamb. Now, um, this is, this is a, a, another reason to rejoice. Uh, don't we always rejoice when uh, there's a wedding on the horizon? Well, again, friends, this is the exact opposite of what goes on in hell. Remember the uh, contrasting uh, mirror image we had in the last chapter. Um, everything that is glorious and wonderful about heaven is missing in hell. There's singing and rejoicing 
in heaven. There's none of that in hell. Um, there's light and truth and enlightenment and, and beautiful things in heaven. There's none of that in hell. Well, we're also told in the last chapter, uh, chapter 18, verse 23, uh, we're told there um, that there's no bride or bridegroom in hell. There's no sound of weddings anymore there. Uh, 18 and 23. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. Uh, the voice of bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. Well, friends, it's the exact opposite in heaven. Here we have the bride and the bridegroom being united. Now, don't get me wrong, friends. I know there's no giving and taking of um, each other in marriage in heaven. The Lord has, has said that. The Lord has told us that. But here we're not talking about individuals getting married. Here the bride is no less than the church itself. Um, the people of Christ together, collectively, are his bride. Uh, he is the bridegroom. We are the bride. And uh, bride and bridegroom are coming together in this great marriage or this great marriage supper that we read about here in chapter 19. Um, and, and we've been prepared for this moment, friends. Um, we, we're made ready um, and, and we're well it's like what we do nowadays still in fact not just nowadays but down through the ages anytime we attend a wedding we put on our good clothes we put on our suits we put on the new dresses and hats and stuff that we've bought okay we put all this on because we um, we're going to a wedding so we're getting dressed up for the occasion well that's the picture that's being painted for us here uh, we read uh, verse 8 um, that to us, to the church, to her, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen. Fine linen, clean and bright. Now, so there we are, we're at this uh, wedding and we are dressed, figuratively speaking, in fine white linen. Now, what does that represent? What are we clothed with? Well, we're told here, friends, still verse 8, the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. That's what we are clothed in, friends. The fine linen that we are dressed up in for this wedding is our righteous acts. Now, I want you to think about that for a wee minute. Because we already have the righteousness of Christ imputed to us or transferred to us our righteousness is no good as it were uh, not good enough to get us into heaven but we have to take on the righteousness of the lord jesus christ now that's not what's being talked about here we're told quite clearly here that these are our righteous acts these are the things that we do in christ's name uh, these are our good works if you like that's what we have to be clothed in. So, again, that begs the question, friends, if we're to get dressed up for this wedding and we are to put on our righteous acts, um, we've got to ask ourselves, what am I putting on? Uh, what are the righteous acts that I am doing for the Lord Jesus Christ? What am I doing in his name here on earth to enable me to be properly dressed to attend this wedding now again i don't want to be misunderstood friends um we are told and we're told continually that we're not saved by our works and i accept that we're saved by the grace of god through faith in the lord jesus christ so we can't save ourselves ourselves by our good works but that doesn't mean friends that we shouldn't do those good works you know a lot of us think that uh, we just have to believe we just have to say the prayer um, we just have to give some sort of mental assent and then we're saved and we, 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 we may well be but how do we prove that we are saved uh, how do we prove that we belong to Christ well it's worked out in our lives how has it worked out in our lives? Through our good works, through our righteous acts, 
Our righteous acts are so, so important, friends. A lot of us um, pray the prayer and sit back and do little or nothing. But then we'll have nothing to wear at the wedding. We mightn't even be invited to the wedding. We have to put on our good works, which are a proof of our salvation. And if there's no fruit, if there's no outworking, if there's no acts of righteousness, there has to be. Because when we are getting married... We have to be properly dressed, not only in the righteousness that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ, but our own righteous acts, our obedience, our holiness is important in our life because it proves that we are saved. I hope hope I've made that clear, friends. And poor John, he's he's so excited about all this, all that he sees in this chapter, uh, when he sees the the heavens worshipping and praising, uh, and all the disembodied spirits, the great creatures, uh, when he sees all this going on, when he sees the, the marriage supper and what's taking place, when he sees Christ and his people coming together in this great way, look at verse 10. I fell at his feet. (laughs) This is the angel uh, who's showing him and introducing him to all this. He falls at the angel's feet to worship him. But the angel says to him, don't do that. (laughs) I'm just your fellow servant. Imagine that, friends, this mighty angel (laughs) whose glory filled the world, who's able to show John all these things. Um, in a wonderful way, he just describes himself as a fellow servant along with John. You're not to worship me. I'm just an angel. I'm just a messenger of God. I'm just a servant, fellow servant like you. Please, don't worship me. He says, you have to worship God. You have to worship God alone. And friends, again, that's another reminder. Let's not rob God of his worship. Uh, Let's not worship angels or any other created being. Uh, Let's not worship ourselves. Let's not worship anything in the world. Let's not worship um, uh, what we get involved in our jobs. Let's, let's, Let's take all those idols away because those only rob God of the worship and the praise that is due to him. So please, uh, the angel says, don't think about uh, uh, worshipping me. Look to God and look to God alone. So there we have in chapter 19, we have uh, the worship of so many uh, in glory. We have the wedding itself, Christ, the bridegroom, coming to his bride, the church. And verses 11 to 16, we'll finish with the word. So the worship, the wedding, and now the word. Uh, Verse 11, uh, John now sees heaven opened, okay? Not just a door and a little look into heaven. Here he sees heaven itself opened wide. And what happens? Out rides the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Verse 11, Um, I saw heaven opened, behold, a white horse. He who sat on him was called faithful and true. Uh, We're told later on, verse 16, this is Christ. This is the King of Kings. This is the Lord of Lords. And he comes out on this, figuratively speaking, he comes out on this great white horse. And the description is given. Here, just look at verse 12 for a little minute. Again, it's all figurative language, but it gives us an idea of what Christ is like. And it's a wonderful description. Uh, For a start, his eyes um, were like a flame of fire. Uh, Friends, his eyes are all-seeing. His eyes are all-powerful. His eyes are um, piercing. They see everywhere. Okay, uh, he rides out from heaven, and there's nothing going to escape his notice. Never has, and never will. His eyes are like fire. His head, still verse twelve. His head was crowned with many crowns. Okay, um, the dragon, Satan, had a limited amount of crowns. Um, but the Lord has many, many crowns. He's far more powerful than Satan. He's a a greater ruler than Satan ever was or ever could be. Uh, 
And his name, of course, we're told here in verse 13, as if there was any doubt at all as to who this rider on the horse is. Verse 13, his name is called the Word of God. Immediately, what do you think of? John 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Lord Jesus Christ, the incarnate Word of God. Here he is riding out from heaven. And, and by the way, friends, this isn't the... Um, the gentle Jesus, meek and mild. No, take a look at the rider in this horse, friends. His robe is already stained with blood. Now, um, could be a reference to his own shed blood, but I'm not so sure. Perhaps this uh, blood is the blood of his enemies, the enemies that he has now conquered. Again, all figurative language, but he rides out and... Um, Verse 13, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And of course, his name is called the Word of God. And he has a sword, friends. Again, I think we know, and we're told elsewhere in Scripture as well, just to back it up, we're told exactly what this sword represents. It's the Word of God. That's what he wields, friends. Um, the sword is the word of God. Uh, out of his mouth goes a sharp, um, some versions say, a sharp two-edged sword, uh, and that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. Friends, the word of God goes out from the mouth of the word of God, as it were. Um, and he uses that sword. He uses that word. Now, how does he use the word of God, friends, as a sword? Well, friends, everything and everybody will be judged by the word of God. That's what we're going to be measured against. We'll be judged by Christ through scripture. And really, what that means is we have to familiarize ourselves with the word of God. If that is the measuring stick for so many things, we need to know what we are being measured against. So do our lives, these righteous acts and so forth, the way we are working out our salvation, do they measure up? Do they match the word of God itself? We have to, friends. In Christ, we have to measure up. To the word of God. So uh, again, there we have it, friends. I, I think I'll leave it there. Um, we have chapter 19. Uh, we have the three W's, if you like, if it's easier to remember for you. We have worship, wedding, and word. And I just want to summarize that in this way. First of all, worship. What about you, friends? How are you worshiping? Ask yourself as an individual, truthfully, be truthful before God. Do you enjoy worship? Do you take every opportunity to worship the Lord? Are you, in, are you enjoying your worship? Are you thrilled by worship? Or do you need to work on your worship? Or are you robbing God of the worship that he so richly deserves? There's the wedding, that great uh, wedding feast that's described. Are you going? Will you be there? Have you accepted the invitation from Christ to attend that wedding? The offer's still available. If you haven't taken it up, take it up now without delay. Accept the invitation. And when you accept the invitation, remember, you've got to get dressed up. You've got to put on those righteous acts. You've got to do those things that the Lord asks you to do. You've got to prepare yourself to be dressed properly at this great wedding. And thirdly, the word. The word that goes out and that the Lord's going to use to judge people. 
Do you know that word? Do you know the scriptures? Do you know the incarnate word of God? But regarding the scriptures, friends, are you reading them? Are you familiarizing yourself with them? Because you'll need to. If you know which righteous acts you should be doing and how you should be serving the Lord and living your life. So there you have it, friends. Uh, Hopefully that's a little bit more uplifting than all the doom and gloom of some of the previous chapters. It's a marvelous occasion. It's the wedding supper or the wedding feast of the Lamb of God himself. Christ and his people coming together in triumph at the end of this age and forever and forever. I'm looking forward to it, friends. I hope you are too. I hope we're all getting prepared. And I look forward to seeing you at the wedding. Amen. Our closing hymn, the second one from our singers and musicians, is uh, entitled, Who Can Know? And of course, uh, it goes on, Who Can Know? The mind of our creator. Well, friends, we can know the mind of our creator through what he reveals of himself in his word. Who can know the mind of our wonderful creator? said at the beginning can I thank you for joining with us today in our worship um, may the Lord have blessed you uplifted you and um, prepared you for whatever the week ahead has in store for you let's conclude our time together 
again before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful marriage that is being prepared. The marriage of the Lamb, the marriage of the Lord Jesus Christ to his people, to his bride, to the church. What a wedding, what an occasion that will be. One that none of us would like to miss. So please, thank you for those who are already preparing for that time. Please speak to those who don't know about this wedding or who as yet have not been invited. Well, they have been invited, but as the word has gone out, perhaps they have not accepted that invitation. Well, we're always told that now is the day of salvation. And while there's life, while there's time, with the Lord there is always hope. So let's make sure that all that we know, all our family, all our friends, all our loved ones, will all be at that wonderful wedding, being brought together with the Saviour forever and forever. Help us if we haven't already. Help us to think on these things, to consider the magnitude, the wonders, the glorious nature of all that's freely available to those who embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. And help us, if it doesn't seem too irreverent, help us just to seize with both hands everything that the Lord is offering, to receive it, receive it gratefully, and to seize it for all eternity. Please hear our prayer and bless us now and forevermore. In the Saviour's name we pray. Amen and amen.